Hi, my name is Jeff. I'm part of the teaching team here at Rainier View, and we are wrapping up a series today called Better Than Normal. Hey, have you ever had the experience of being misunderstood? Right? There's nothing more frustrating than that happening. And so today we want to look at the question, how can we make a difference when it feels like nobody's listening? And so there's a recent commercial that has been playing a lot, and it really captures some of the frustration that comes when our words are misheard, and so let's check this out. I'm really nervous. I don't know what I should wear. Just wear something not too crazy. Remember, it's a business dinner, not a costume party. On the Spotty Network, this is what she heard. Just wear something crazy. Remember, it's a costume party. Costume party? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't trust first impressions to just any network. Go with T-Mobile, the crown jewel of 5G. Anybody want to split a turkey leg? And so when we don't hear others clearly, there can be misunderstandings, there can be miscommunications, and that can be frustrating. Uh, and, that's, and that's one thing. It's, an, it's one thing, though, to blame poor communication on bad reception. It's another thing completely to feel like nobody is listening to us, that none of our words are making the kind of difference that we want to see in our families, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our communities, uh, in our nations, where, wherever we are. That's a completely different thing altogether. Really being heard, speaking my truth, even just, hey, check out my blog or podcast or whatever, right? We're so consumed with connecting our voices being heard with making a difference, as if there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. And we get so frustrated when those things are, are not happening or not taking place. And maybe it's not even our voice. Maybe we look to repost something else that somebody else has said, right? Because this is something that needs to be heard. And we feel so good. We get that little endorphin rush when we, we feel like we've, we've said something that's going to make a difference. But the reality is sometimes, do those words matter? Do those words connect? Do we know that they're making a difference, even if we feel like they are? Uh, and again, this can happen in so many, so many places and spaces in, in online, in our real life relationships, whether it's our own voice, whether it's somebody else's voice that we want to elevate and make sure that it's heard, right? The, the question is, is it making a difference? Is it making the impact we want to seek? And so often we tie that to others hearing and listening to the words that we want them to, but that doesn't, ha that doesn't happen. And so we can get frustrated. And when we get frustrated, we can opt for one of two choices. We can opt to simply speak louder and more aggressively and just get more in people's face to kind of, hey, to really shake them up and, and hear, what they, hear what we want them to hear. Or we can just stop caring. We can throw up our hands and say, well, I tried and act as if our, our words don't matter. You know, the Bible talks about really the power of words over and over again. Our words are so important. Uh, and so just, just one place, one verse that attests to this. In um, Ephesians 4, verse 29, it says this. Ephesians 4, 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. But when it feels like nobody's listening... It's hard to stay focused on the benefit of others and making sure our words are, are an encouragement to those who hear. And so I think we've got to shift our focus. So much of the world encourages us to be an influencer or to gain followers or just that, that somehow that your voice needs to be heard. And if that's not happening, then, then it's somebody else's fault. And we've got to change that narrative a little bit. We've we got to really kind of shift away from, you know, getting people to decide what's most important and agreeing with us, right? Like even in your family right now, there's some probably some very important questions that you want other people to agree with, like where you're going to pick up dinner from tonight, okay? Uh, but in all seriousness, true change comes from God working within our inner lives and that coming out. And so we've been looking at this whole series in John 15 about being connected to the vine, and that we remain, we abide, we're connected to Jesus, and that we're transformed. And out of that, a new life comes forth. A different kind of way of living comes out of our lives from being connected to Jesus. Uh, and so we've looked at that uh, in week one and just in our pursuit of God. We've looked at really engaging in the kind of community that Jesus invites us to, 
a kind of community where we experience the support from other people as well as giving support to others. But maybe you're like me sometimes, where you desperately want more people to experience the hope and the peace and the joy and the security that comes from your faith, but it's difficult to talk about or you feel like it's not connecting in the way you'd like. Like, it just doesn't seem that if we're going to pursue God this way and we're going to engage in community this way and be radically committed to one another, then why don't we see more people responding uh, on our timetable, at least, and, and how we'd like to? Like, are people just not listening? How do we get them to listen? How do, we, how do we make a difference when it seems like nobody is listening? Well, Jesus knew that that first generation of disciples was going to face this. Face people who, quite literally, were going to oppose them because of their faith. And so let's jump back in towards the end of John 15 and see what Jesus has to say to his disciples, picking up in verse 18. We read this. Jesus says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. And when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. And so how do we, thousands of years removed, really understand this discussion that Jesus is having with his disciples, his followers, about the persecution that they might encounter? And so what we need to understand from that original context, that first setting, in a couple verses later in John 16, uh, we read that this was talked about in terms of being thrown out of the synagogue, okay? And so most of us have not had that experience. Uh, many of us don't come from a Jewish background, but the very first followers of Jesus all came from this Jewish background. And so for them, synagogue was life. It was the center of all of their social relationships. It was where you would get married. It was where you would celebrate the high points and the low points, uh, experience incredible joy and sadness with your people. It was the center of all of that. But faith in Jesus upended that social fabric, those social relationships. It was a cause of massive loss to that first generation of followers of Jesus because faith in Jesus looks anything like normal. Jesus invites us to something better than normal, but that doesn't mean we're not going to experience loss. So we're probably not going to be uh, put out of the synagogue in the same way that the first uh, followers of Jesus experienced. But choosing faith in Jesus and really walking it out may very well upend the social fabric of your life. It, it may change the relationships that you have, that as you make uh, your, the reordering of your time and preferences and the way you live your life, that might put distance, that might create a little bit of angst, even hostility at times between friends and family as you get serious about following Jesus and living this out in your life. But does the passage that we read, does it mean that we must be persecuted, right? Like that, that you seek it out somehow so you can wear it like a little badge of honor, like the I voted sticker, but you can just put on the I was persecuted sticker and somehow it, it proves how legit you are as a follower of Jesus. Is that what's going on here? Well, in the, reading a passage like this, it can lead us really to, to ask two questions. Uh, one, we'll read a passage like this and then, well, should we assume that our stance should be one of aggression and hostility, hostility towards the world around us because it hates us. We kind of take this aggressive fight stance. Or 
well, the world is so wicked, it's so bad, it's so evil. So we should seek to remove ourselves to be apart from the world as much as possible. And really, these two options, these fight or flight options, are very normal for Christians to embrace in trying to figure out how do I relate to the world around me. But Jesus invites us to a better option. We don't have to to opt for fighting the world in this aggressive, hostile way. We don't have to opt for the solution of just not caring about the world or withdrawing from it and and being isolated from from it. Uh, as, As we see, the answer is found in being like Jesus and living a life that he lays out for us. As we see later, we're going to see later on in the passage in, in John that Jesus will, will pray for us. And he says, Father, I pray not that you would take them out of the world, but that they wouldn't be like the world, okay? That they would remain in the world, but not of it, is how your translation probably reads. That we would display the kind of life that Jesus is nourishing and growing within us, and that that becomes a transformative force in our world, that that is how we interact with the world around us. And so back to those original people who first put their faith in Jesus. It's interesting that faith in Jesus continued to spread among people coming from Jewish backgrounds. So clearly, these followers of Jesus didn't cut people out of their lives. They weren't like, oh, you're toxic, and, you know, I need to unfriend you, not have nothing to do with you. No, faith in Jesus continued to be embraced because they didn't fight back with hostility or condemnation. They didn't withdraw and, and just have nothing to do with people from their former life, their former world. Instead, they fought back with a life of love modeled on the way that Jesus lived and being, being invited to live that way by Jesus. That is what ended up transforming the relationships around them, that, that other people chose to embrace faith. They listened. Their words and their actions ended up making a difference because they were choosing to live and speak like Jesus. Now, yes, there are going to be times where we are not received well because of our faith, that we might be maliciously talked about even, But that should never look like, our response should never look like a constant stream of verbal attack and abuse against the world or them, whoever they are. In particular, when we equate them with people of the political party opposite of us, most often in these discussions. And so at the same time, we need to recognize that fully embracing faith in Jesus is never going to to look like everybody loving us all the time and nobody ever having any issues with what we think. That's just not reality. We're going to face some challenges, but we don't seek out to, you know, we don't seek out persecution, nor do we seek to judge the world around us. So let's take an example of one value that embracing faith can lead to opposition in our world. Uh, I want to talk about the value of really that we, that we get from the Bible that's unique uh, to, to the Jewish scriptures first, and then uh, to the Christian faith secondly, the, the value of every life, every single life having worth, because God says that we're created in his image. And so as people of faith, we're called to value life from the earliest stages to the final moments and, and everything in between. And so we believe that that extends to the life of those who are unborn, Now, there's not space to to get into a discussion about about when does life begin, but that as people of faith, we should be concerned about life at the earliest stages and all the way to those final moments of life. But an embrace of this value, many Christians can be criticized that, oh, you are just part of a a backwards, bigoted crusade that, that seeks to be against women and props up a system of social inequality, and, and that that's what you're doing by embracing this value. And so some believe that then, well, we should fight. We should fight, like with condemnation against the world. And it looks like picket signs and, and, and making just, you know, brutal, mean posts uh, about, about others, or even just that it's, it's about a political victory, that somehow that's how this value is embraced. But the way of Jesus, the way to fight in our world, is to meet people where they're at. In the midst of a scary moment in their life where a pregnancy has 
happened and they're not sure what to do, their options are limited, that we walk alongside people in the scariest and the most challenging times. That's the way of Jesus. That's what it looks like to fight for the value of worth of every person. To help provide resources and support for those uh, that feel like they have no other options. And so for us at Rainier View, this looks like the support of CareNet, uh, which, is, which is a local crisis uh, pregnancy center, but it's so much more than that. It provides a holistic support around pregnancy, both for moms and dads, like I said, who feel like they have limited to no options. And again, I know some of us joining, we're just going to get lumped into this category of just, just haters and we don't understand the world and we're, we're, we're unfairly limiting people's options. But the reality is that CareNet provides such a, a broader whole life support. There's one-on-one -on -one mentorship, not only for moms, but for dads as well. Uh, there, there's parenting classes. There's abortion recovery support groups. There's so much care around, again, not just simply caring for the life of the unborn, but caring for the moms and dads in the, in, in the entire scope of life as well. And we got to understand something else as well here. I was talking to uh, the director of CareNet locally here in Pierce County once, and he said, you know, statistically, one in four women in your church have experienced abortion at some point in their life. And so we cannot not wrestle with that. We have to be committed to our church being a place where grace is fully grasped and completely lived out. And that any woman who has experienced abortion recently or decades ago can find healing, can find grace, and that we're committed to living that out together. Because that is what Jesus does. That's how Jesus meets people. That's how we're called to live out this value as well. And that's just one example of one value. We could go on and on and on. But the reality is that for, for so many Christians, not so many, but for some who claim, you know, I'm being persecuted for my faith. I'm, I'm being persecuted because I'm standing up for the truth. Uh, it's really our character that's turning people off. It's not our faith in Jesus, right? Here, here's the reality. Like, I've met some people who claim to be followers of Jesus, but they're just abrasive, and they're rude, and they're, un, they're unkind, right? And so the question is, are you being persecuted for your faith in Jesus, or are you just being a jerk, <laughs> right? And like, that might be hard to hear. We might not be aware of that, but that's why we have to be in community where, where we can really get the perspective of other people speaking into our lives. And maybe unintentionally, we just come across as angry and bitter all the time. If that's true, nobody is going to listen to what you have to say about Jesus. And so we've got to think about the posture of our lives. Because again, if we're really attached to the vine, if we're really connected and attached to Jesus, our inner lives are going to be changed. And so there's going to be some fruit that comes from that. There's going to be some different results in my life as a result of practicing the things that Jesus invites me to practice. And so we're going to look at probably the, the most well-known list in Galatians 5 of this fruit that is born in our lives. And first, we're going to read about uh, some fruit that comes from just our own sinful desires and then how that compares to the fruit that's born when we embrace faith in Jesus and following him fully. So uh, look with me at Galatians 5 verse 19. It says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. And so as you look at that first list of vices, really, 
Uh, it can be easy to hone in on some of those, those big sins, sexual immorality, drunkenness, wild parties, and we can see these, these big sins. But the reality, I've met plenty of people in church who've, who've embraced some of the ones that we like to gloss over, that quarrel, that create division, that create dissension, uh, that they're out, there's outbursts of anger, there's, they're actively gossiping. Okay, Uh, just because a lot of times they just don't like that something changed, uh, that they don't like the the music or or the way things are being done. And so somehow that justifies acting this way. And in fact, sometimes Christians even can embrace, you know what, if we're not being heard, we need to be brasher. We need to be more intense. We need to be more embracing these vices. And, And a lot of Christians have drifted into this lane of thinking that that's okay because they need to be heard. And what we need to understand is that will never lead to making a difference ultimately. All it will lead is to creating relational discord and pain and division, the opposite of what Jesus wants to create in his community. And so if your angry comment, whether it's in real life or online, you're like, oh, that felt so good. That's a pretty good indicator that that was not born out of being connected to Jesus. It's a pretty good indicator that when we go off on somebody and we feel justified and great about it, that that's actually springing from our sin nature within us, okay? And so where do we begin with making a difference in our world where, where, where our words are heard clearly? Well, I think we begin by earning the right to be heard. And again, it could be a cliche statement, but it is so true. We need to earn the right to be heard, our lives matching up with what we speak. So we need to reject arrogant and condemning language as if we're justified in in talking about some people or talking to some people that way. We start by embracing the love for one another that we talked about last week as we looked at engaging in community, that really a sacrificial, others-focused kind of love, not looking for my own interests, but looking to the interests of others. And then we add a second rail to that kind of love of unity. And so in John 17, we're kind of jumping to the end of Jesus' heart for his followers, not just the 12 that were gathered with him at that point in time, but for any and all who would claim to be followers of Jesus. Let's look in John 17, verse 20. Jesus says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may become one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you've given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love that you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. And so there is a lot there, but what I love about this what's so clear from Jesus' heart here is that the most effective apologetic we have is not an argument, but it's an uncommon love and unity. The most effective way we can have the world listen is not with some well-crafted argument to trick them into faith. It's modeling and a completely uncommon love and unity for one another that is completely absent and missing in so many people's lives. This is the heart of what Jesus wants for us, but it takes hard work to pursue. And honestly, I think some Christians would rather just be satisfied condemning the world around them, just kind of sitting and throwing bombs online or just, or just complaining nonstop about the world, and that they're kind of just fine with that. I think what the good news is, is that that doesn't define most Christians. Most of us deeply desire to want to create the kind of community that we read about here, that's Jesus' heart for us. The question is, how do we go about doing that? Where do we start? Well, there's no shortcut for the simple answer 
we start by really being in community with one another. And maybe right now in our lives, we don't have that kind of community. We don't have a smaller group of people that we're experiencing this kind of sacrificial love and care for one another. The good news is that you can jump into that community here. We have so many options for you to do that. And on your connection card or even in in the chat box this morning, if you're joining us live, you can go ahead and indicate, hey, I would love to take part in a rooted experience. If you don't know about that, you can find out more about that online at rainierview.org slash rooted. But it's an amazing experience uh, to, to kind of help you re-engage with your faith if you just kind of feel blah right now about it or you've drifted for a while. We have so many more options than that. We've got community groups that meet regularly. We've got classes that are starting up. If you're, again, if you're joining us live this fall uh, to help you get financially healthy. And if, you've got, uh, if you're grieving the loss of somebody, grief share groups starting up. Uh, we've got RVCC Kids every Sunday morning. We've got an amazing kids program, but also small groups for students to, or for kids to be known and, and to be cared for by others in the church that, that they can be invested in, even at a young age. We've got RVCC students that meets during the week. Same thing for teenagers to have a place that, that meets them where they are at and that they can experience community and care, not only from adult leaders, but connections with peers as well. There are so many ways to be connected. Just find a way. Find some community to be part of within hopefully our local church, but, but a local church is healthy and is committed to the gospel and seeing that lived out in, in real ways in the community around it. And lastly, if you're joining us live, on September 26th, the Sunday, September 26th, we are having Serve Sunday, where we take our worship services and we're not in the building. We go to some local schools nearby uh, and, and we pull weeds and we lay bark and we prayer walk. And we encourage you to come out for that. Don't, don't allow any excuse, like a little bit of rain, like go buy your 199 poncho right now so that you're ready to join us and jump in. But don't miss out on it. Don't, don't be like, ah, oh, this is a good morning for me to sleep in uh, or any other excuse. Be part of making a difference. You know, others in our community actually want to join us for this event. And so will we show up? We show up and will we model this? Uh, just one more thought from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, where we read this. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. You know, we are so concerned often with speaking our truth. Let's be the kind of community that seeks to serve others regardless of their response. Let's be the kind of community that earns the right to be heard because then we'll be able to truly make a difference in the lives of others in Pierce County and beyond. Hey, thank you for joining us and we hope you'll be back next week. Hey, I'm Mike, the digital ministry pastor here. If you like what you saw today, we invite you to click that subscribe button and hit the notification bell to be updated on everything we have going on here. Also, if you need prayer, if you have any questions, or you just want to reach out, be sure to email me at mikep at rainerview.org. Thanks again for being part of the RBCC family today.